Maybe. Hello and welcome to the Intellectual Property Rights for Agricultural Research and Development webinar for the Eastern Hemisphere. This is co-hosted by WIPO Green as well as the Big Data and CGIAR platform. My name is Ariana and you will see my name in the chat on the webinar platform. I will be facilitating the question and answer session for our hosts throughout the session. If you have any questions or technical concerns that come to mind, please do let me know in the chat directly to the right of this video. I'm joined today by three live panelists. The first is Dr. Peter Oxen, Senior Program Officer at WIPO Green. Peter has more than 20 years of experience in socioeconomic development and natural resources management and holds a Master of Science in Geography and a PhD in Development Studies. I'm also joined by Ms. Anya von der Rapp, Senior Program Coordinator at WIPO Green. Anya has experience in intellectual property and innovation in relation to global public policy issues such as climate change, food security, and public health. She holds a master's degree in European Legal Studies from the College of Europe. And finally, by Mr. Yan Zong, Associate Program Officer at WIPO Green. Yan supports the WIPO Green Consortium, including partnership, database management, maintenance, and technology evaluation. Yan is educated at the College of Pharmacy at Dalian Medical University and the Commercial and Economic Law School of China. Yan holds a lawyer qualification certificate in China. And finally, I'm joined also in absentia by Mr. Brian King, and I'm just going to share a brief statement that he shared with all of us today. So Brian King is the coordinator for the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture upon which we are watching this webinar. And here's what he shared with us today. CGIAR as a global research organization has historically focused on generating international public goods from our research. What many may not realize, however, is that the intellectual property policy of CGIAR is much more nuanced than just producing public goods. CGIAR's strategy is nested within the sustainable development goals and focuses on bringing certain outcomes into being in the world related to livelihoods and sustainable and functional ecosystems. The CGIAR IP policy recognizes that sometimes IP protection may best serve the outcomes we seek and any IP decisions we make are supposed to flow from and be evaluated by the extent to which they may contribute to these outcomes. The World Intellectual Property Organization is office, often associated with private patents, but they too work across the spectrum of IP and also have linkages to the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. This webinar series gives us a forum to see how we might explore further collaborations on bringing the full force of innovation to bear on global agricultural development. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our colleagues at White Bow Green to kick off today's webinar. Dr. Oxen, I think we'll start us off. And so, um, Dr. Oxen, if you want to just speak up a little bit, I think maybe we might be having a little bit of difficulty hearing you right now, or perhaps it's yes. on mute from your side. Sorry. So I think we've got things up and running now. So uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Ariana, and to Brian and Absentia also. So uh, we are here from Waipo Green in Geneva, and we are very happy to be able to present to you some ideas about, first of all, how our organization can contribute to the work of CGI research and make it more, uh, get it more out on the market and in the villages. And we are also going to talk to you about intellectual property rights and how that works in relation to this. And this is very much in the line of the introduction of Brian, of Brian King uh, just a minute ago, where we also, uh, work for an organization that see uh, intellectual property as a means to uh, to support the SDGs. This is the basic foundation of the organization that we work for here, but we'll get back to that. So without any further, oh, this one doesn't work. Doesn't work. Oh, yeah. So without any further, we'll go to the uh, what we're going to talk about today. So we'll start with a short introduction of who we are, and then we'll try to see into how uh, the intellectual property rights fits into agricultural research for development in general. And we'll get a little bit more into the technical details of IP uh, instruments and especially patents, which is the most relevant here. And then we'll also be talking about technology transfer and how to approach uh, 
uh, more practically intellectual property for agricultural resources. But first, I'll give the word to Anja van der Roep, who will take us through who we are and what we do. Thank you so much. So for those of you who don't know the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, WIPO is part of the UN system. It's one of the specialized agencies, such as uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, and the Food and Agricultural Organization. We focus on um, innovation and creativity and how it contributes to the economic, social, and cultural development of all countries. And we do that through uh, promoting a balanced and effective intellectual property system. And that has several implications uh, or several work streams. Uh, that's in the area of norm setting. We administer different um, international intellectual property treaties that um, provide the framework for a system, registration systems for trademarks, industrial designs, appellations of origin, and a global filing system for patents. That we also do uh, capacity building and um, policy work. And in that vein, sorry, <laughs> um, WIPO has created uh, a, a mechanism uh, that we have launched in 2013. And the background for this is that intellectual property and innovation don't uh, exist in, as an end in themselves, uh, but as a part of, and I think also Brian said that in his introductory statement, as part of uh, a set of tools that help you reach uh, broader policy goals. And in that sense, uh, WIPO also has a contribution to make sure that uh, the wealth of innovation and intellectual property that exists contributes to um, making a contribution towards achieving broader policy goals. In this context here, we speak about uh, climate change and uh, broader sustainable development goals uh, more generally, uh, as you all know. Um, so the, the idea is that um, WIPO has created a mechanism that uh, makes available IP and innovation um, and uh, helps spread IP and innovation that uh, can make a contribution towards achieving those goals. This is also expressed in um, the development agenda, which um, underlines the, the mandate that uh, WIPO has to, to make a contribution to um, the development uh, of uh, countries uh, that are not so far advanced in, in terms of their development through technology transfer. So as I said, we launched WIPO Green in 2013. It's basically um, a marketplace uh, that consists of public and private actors that work together in order to promote uh, green technology innovation and diffusion. It connects those seeking environment, environmentally sustainable solutions with those who provide them. So it's really about uh, putting the, the ends together and making connections between the different actors. And that should help, or the, the objective is that we want to contribute to a more efficient adaptation deployment of green technology solutions. We also want to support innovation and provide innovators with a platform to promote their technologies, particularly those coming from the developing world. We also engage closely with the private sector, who up till now is the source of 80% of innovation in the green space. And through the experiences that we gain and that our users and members of the network um, gain, we want to feed into the global policy dialogue to inform uh, what elements are um, important in order to, to, make, to have a, a functioning innovation ecosystem that contributes to um, achieving those broader policy goals that I mentioned before. We work with a very diverse network of partners that uh, currently we have 89 partners and uh, those partners come from various sectors. So they range from multinational companies um, over small medium enterprises. They represent research institutions, uh, NGOs, uh, and also sister UN organizations. The idea is really that 
they represent both specific expertise in the innovation value chain uh, from innovation towards uh, dissemination of technology. Also with regard to the, the different uh, sectors that are represented or important for, for green technology solution, but also in a geographical sense, uh, representing um, stakeholders from different regions in the world. And also in terms of the, the nature of the institutions uh, they have different expertise, obviously, to, to contribute. And that all comes together um, to, towards achieving our, our mission. With those partners, we engage uh, in, uh, on events and, and projects. There's no fee, but uh, the, the requirement is that the partners contribute to Viper Green's work. You can see in the background some of the logos of the institutions that are being represented. The second pillar next to the network is the database. There are eight broad categories, and this is part of how we define uh, what is a green technology. So there's building and constructions, farming and forestry, green products, chemicals and advanced materials, transportation, water, green products and pollution and waste. And I think of particular importance to, to this audience here is the, the category of farming and forestry, where we really um, are also using this webinar to make a call to um, have more of your technologies that could uh, make a contribution added to our green uh, database. This is a slide representing the technology readiness. Um, and it's meant to, to tell you that, I mean, at the moment, there are three categories. Uh, so there are technologies that are under R&D, technologies that are at a usable level, and um, technologies that are already being uh, sold and commercialized. Mm -hmm. And they're broadly speaking, uh, representing or um, similar shares uh, with some degree of uh, difference. I said in the beginning that um, we achieve our goal of contributing to the dissemination of green technology through connecting providers and those who are looking for green technology solutions. And we call that uh, matchmaking or acceleration. This is being done at different levels. So there's the database level where you can, on the one hand, upload technologies but on the other hand, also upload uh, or describe what you're looking for. So what your, your technical problem is or, and what you're looking for. And uh, in that sense, uh, you can connect at the database level through contacting either those who provide technologies or contacting those who are looking for technologies. We also have um, facilitate matchmaking at the request of partners. Um, some of our partners have assembled several needs. Uh, for instance, the um, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, entity KA Care uh, has a mandate of um, localizing green energy uh, technologies in Saudi Arabia. They have uploaded several um, high quality needs of technologies that they are looking to acquire. And we have organized also a webinar with them to promote those needs and incentivize providers to, to um, respond to these needs. And then the, the, la the last part um, uh, is that we organize uh, certain acceleration projects. We've done um, since 2015, one on average every year uh, in different regions of the world and uh, covering different um, technology sectors. So in 2015, there was one on wastewater management in Southeast Asia, Asia, then one on water and agriculture in East Africa, then one on water in Geneva that was more of an event than a project. And then I want to highlight uh, uh, the current one that we're doing now, which is on the next slide. Our current acceleration project in Chile, Brazil and Argentina. So as I said, the methodology is that uh, we work with local partners who look for concrete uh, technology needs. So entities that are 
uh, seeking to or that have that face uh, certain environmental problems or climate change problems and that are seeking to acquire green technologies to solve those problems. And the idea is to connect them with those who, who then uh, can provide such solutions. This year we focus on climate smart agriculture, uh, more particularly in Chile on the wine production sector, in Brazil on zero till, in, in Argentina on crop rotation, soil recarbonization, zero till and cattle rearing. The local partners in, in this project are the intellectual property offices of those countries, the ministries of agriculture, the producer associations and also the Inter-American Development Bank. We've kicked off the, the project uh, just uh, a month ago and uh, it's now in a very intensive phase and the idea is to wrap up until the end of the year and have then some, some follow through early next year. The major activity is to identify those needs and um, the, the corresponding solutions and facilitate the connection. We're not there to negotiate between the parties, but we're there to activate our network to, to make that transfer possible. The needs can be, or the needs are local. The solutions can be both local or global if no solutions are available within the countries or in the region. If you're interested in uh, this project, we are uh, inviting you also to, to contact us and, and let us know that uh, you might have um, needs that fall into those sectors or you might have solutions that uh, fall into the, those sectors and that you think could, uh, could be of help in this regard. So overall speaking, as a user, um, there are several benefits. We have a broad global network in um, more than 170 countries. So by registering on the database, you can connect um, with, with those members of the network and uh, contact them and get information about the several activities that uh, are being carried out within our network. You can use the platform to promote uh, your technologies as well both your technologies and needs, but particularly if you have developed technologies, you can upload them on the database and get free of charge international promotion. And also uh, be part of this um, matchmaking work that I've mentioned earlier. So we also have a, a track record of connections that we facilitated through either database introductions or um, bilateral introductions um, and that are represented in letters of intent and completed deals. And as I said, you, you are um, informed of the various activities um, that we carry out and that our partners carry out, such as matchmaking events, green tech exhibitions, other partner events, and you also receive a discount on micro mediation arbitration services. All you need to do is to register on the website and then you can upload a technology or a need if you're looking for technologies. And the only condition that I should mention here as well is that you need to be uh, an organization and not an individual in order to upload technologies or needs. If you're an individual, you can still contact others, but you can't upload technologies and needs. That's one of our measures of uh, quality control. Um, other things I'll only mention very briefly, we also developed a licensing checklist for those who want to engage in um, licensing uh, agreements uh, where you have a list of issues that you should look at to prepare before you go into such negotiations. That's also available on our website. And then WIPO as a whole offers different services, uh, which is patent scope, where you have the full set of uh, patent um, documents that come through either the PCT application system that uh, we'll explain in more detail, but also the participating national regional offices. The technology and innovation support centers provide also information to innovators in developing countries uh, in order to facilitate access to IP information and related services. There's the academy that offers various courses 
and uh, there are also reduced fees for um, participants in developing countries. And then there's the access to research and development and innovation program that makes scientific and technical information uh, more readily available um, to users in developing countries. And then a lot of SME related content training and capacity building as well as publications. Last but not least, there's an inventor assistance program that helps users in certain developing countries. Currently it's available in Colombia, Ecuador, Morocco, Philippines and South Africa to go through the patenting procedures in order to help them with those procedures uh, for filing um, patents. Again, this is intended to help inventors and small businesses in de developing countries to, to get patent protection for their inventions. With that, I'm handing over to my colleague Peter in order to go with you through the rest of the, the presentation. Thank you. So thank you, Anna. So this was an introduction to Green and what we do and what we can do for CGRI in helping you in implementing your the knowledge of your innovations and also your technology transfer. And I hope that you you um, that you you caught the message that you are very welcome to contact us for any inquiries as to whether how to upload technologies, but also how we can assist you in in reaching out a, a broader audience for your innovations. Now, talking about innovations, then this is where we are now going a little bit more into how the intellectual property rights system can assist in in protecting the rights of people like you who sometimes get really good ideas that can be part of public goods and can be used in many different ways. And we're going to try to show how this can be uh, used in various ways through the IPR system and why it is a necessity for a lot of organizations to go into these things. Now, first of all, there are a lot of um, uh, discussions about what IPR and patents and so on, what they actually can contribute to and why are they relevant for a public institution. The argument sometimes goes, and I've listed a few of them here on the slide, that public research is public and therefore it's also destined for public use, which is uh, of course absolutely correct. But there is also sometimes a blurring of the lines between the public and private research. Uh, funding may come from private sources. Some of the results may be used by private companies or being used through seed companies and so on to be put into the market. So it's not all that simple necessarily. And even if it's just a matter of having it distant for public use, there might still be a very good reason for protecting your intellectual property rights. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. There is also sometimes the argumentation that if you start to get into too much in, on the IP issues, you are also leading to a privatization of public goods. Um, and again, a valid argument, but again, also, it's not necessarily so simple. And it's not like you today have a very strict division between the public and private. Then we have the issue also that, that or the argument that once the public research as it is financed publicly, it means it's financed by taxes. So if you start extracting value that through a assistance of the IP system, well, then you're in a way you're double taxing the people that you should actually be benefiting. Again, a valid argument. But then also um, there was uh, maybe this uh, citation which you have heard, which was uh, by Bill Gates at the uh, climate summit here a month ago. Um, and at the same time, he pledged $310 million over the next three years to the CGRA and congratulations with that, by the way. But that again shows that it's not as simple that money are just coming from the taxes. It can also come in from private sources. And therefore this argument about double taxing may not always uh, be as valid as it sounds on the face of it. Now, the relevance of CGR and of IPR in a CGRI context is very much related to that every innovation or technology has a rumor as an owner somewhere. Somebody came up with the idea. Uh, and basically what the IP system is that it can help to clarify these rules on 
in, of, in, of interaction. And to do that early on is normally a very good idea if you want to interact with a third party. This also means that there's more likely success of the technology transfer and of diffusion of your technology if these things are clarified from the beginning. So you avoid any conflicts or any infringements of rights and so on and so forth. In the research world, a public research world, the uh, establishment of public-private partnerships is quite a lot in vogue at the moment, and I'm sure many of you are already involved in such programs. They can be very good and very effective. They can be less effective in some cases, but the fact is that it is a political demand in many places. And when you enter into a public-private partnership, the private part may actually see a clear IP rules as a prerequisite. Uh, and I'll get back to that a little bit later on why that is the case. Uh, we also believe that, uh, and that's the whole basis for the IP system as it is set up within WIPO and the UN system is that we believe that basically securing the rights of the owners is a part of stimulating innovation. If you don't get any benefit from what you're doing or others just take whatever you have done and use it for their own benefits, uh, without giving anything back to the owner in the end, well, then there's less incentive for making innovation. And so it's a very simple way of thinking of things, and it may not always be true, but it's a very basic principle that certainly in many cases also will be true. So therefore, we also believe that it helps promote new technologies, and therefore we also think that in general, IP should be seen as an opportunity, as a security, as a protection, as a safeguard, and not as much as a barrier as it is sometimes being portrayed as. Now, the IP system is just a small part of a larger clockwork. It's uh, part of what we call the innovative ecosystem or the national system of innovation, as it's also referred to. And this is a combination of many factors. And the the, it starts all the way from, it, from investment in education in the primary school and way up to tertiary sector, uh, education sector and the research and development. If there's no investment in that, you don't have the human capital who will be able to, to, to create new technologies, get new ideas and get them out there. In order to get it out there, you also need access to capital, both private government, venture capital and all the other types of capital that is out there. You need professional services, you need IP laws and enforcement. If the laws are there, but they're not enforced, they're not worth good. You need the policing that's to support the research in technology development, and you need an entrepreneurial willingness. And the entrepreneurial willingness is a kind of a fluffy term, but it's something that when you visit different countries and you talk to startups and entrepreneurs, you'll very often hear that, oh, the young in this country, they don't want to start their own things. They just want to be public servants or things like that. And this is part of this mentality that you find in different societies. And how that is being up, up I'm not going into here because actually I don't know. But it's a very complicated thing, but it's a very important factor that has to be there. And then there are many or more also. Now, this system or national system of, of innovation or the innovation ecosystem is one of the parts that has to be in place when you do a successful technology transfer. Basically, technology transfer is about sharing knowledge. And therefore, it's not just a matter of selling a product or getting it out on the market. It's also about the knowledge. It's about transferring the ability for the recipient to be able to manufacture, to use, to further develop, improve, sell and distribute a technology and probably many more things. So it's a matter of using the technology, developing and so on, getting it further out there and not just get a product and put it out on the market. And this is, of course, where technology transfer becomes a little bit more complex. And this is why we need this functional innovation system to be in place. All the different uh, gears have to be in place in order for the whole machine to work. We also need to have, again, this entrepreneurial friendly environment. And again, it's many things. It's a bundle of rights. It's a bundle of opportunities. It's the laws. It's all the different things. And, and, and non-corrupt administration, for example, that means that you can get your goods in through the containers that are in the port and not being held up by, by, uh, by corrupt uh, 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 tax officials there. It's all these kind of things that has to be in place in order for the technology transfer to actually take place. 
Now, sometimes you hear the argument that patent is a hindrance for technology transfer, and it might be true in some cases. But if we look into the, um, into the figures of green technology, then only about 1% of green technologies, and here we are talking energy and all the kind of other things, are actually uh, patented in developing countries. So that means that it's not really the patents in term that, that holds back the use of green technology in developing countries. Now here I'm talking about green technology. I'm not talking about uh, seeds and, and stuff like that, agricultural, um, agricultural uh, new plant varieties and stuff like that. There the picture might be different. And yes, sometimes the patents uh, may enter into a more complicated uh, cause and effect. But in, in general, uh, there is not much empirical, uh, shall we say, basis for rejecting patents as a, as a tool in, in technology transfer. Now, the benefits of the IP system is basically that it clarifies ownership. It uh, a system that is protected by national laws and these national laws are linked up to international treaties. And we here in this house manage 23 of these international treaties. Um, the, 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 I think in relation to what we are talking about here, it's the basic thinking that if something is a good business, then diffusion is likely to be really fast. It's related to the technology transfer again. So if you want something to get out there, the fastest and best way of doing that is to make a good business because then you can make sure that the incentive for getting the thing out there and using it is in place. And this is where the IP system comes in because it can support making your invention into a good business. And one of the ways it does that is that it facilitates investment by lowering the risk. If you want somebody, a private party, to invest in, in bringing your invention out there, well, then you need to make sure that the risk of is, is as low as possible. And one of the ways of avoiding risk is to make sure that, yes, this belongs to me. Nobody else can go in and take this idea away from me because I have the exclusive rights of using this and I can determine who is going to use it now. So therefore, it creates this confidence that is necessary to, to share a technology. And most, more importantly also, it, in, it empowers an inventor to go in and engage with the big players in the, in the field and also among rich and poor countries. So if you have very clear ownership uh, rights to your invention, well, then you have a very good starting point for negotiating with uh, partners who may be much bigger and may be much more intimidating than what you're normally used to, to dealing with. And that might not least in the relationship between uh, rich and poor countries. So by using this system, you end up with wonderful things like the anti-eating face mask that you see here that was patented only in 1982, and which is not a torture instrument, but it's actually an instrument that is invented in order for cooks that they don't get too tempted to eat the food. And if you look carefully, there's a little padlock on the side of the strings attaching it to the face of the poor cook there so that he won't get tempted to take it off and eat the food anyway. Now, we have certain assets uh, that are part of the IP system, and that depends on what kind of IP rights we're talking about. So if you have an innovative product or a process, well, then we're talking about patents. And this is what we will be talking about mostly today because that's most relevant for the work of CTRI. If you are having a distinctive sign, well, then we're talking trademarks. Everybody knows those. If you are doing designs, well, then you get design rights, which are what they protected also. If you do literary works, what I'm sure you are familiar with, then you get copyright, which is a special type of of intellectual property right also. Confidential business information is protected or can be protected by, as a trade secret. And then you've got geographical origins, which is special products which are, or are particular to a certain region and therefore can be marketed based on that. That one we are not going to go further into here. So we're not going into all of these in detail because they're not that relevant for you, but we stick to the most relevant ones and we will start out with the patents. So generally a patent is a right that is provided for a fixed time and generally is 20 years. 
So what's very important to understand is that a patent or the right that goes with it only applies to a specific territory. So it's only valid where it's granted. So if you apply for a patent in one country, well, then you've got your rights protected there, but you don't have it in the neighboring country unless you have also specifically applied for it there. So the rights that you have can be enforced in court because they're generally recognized in the laws of each country. And it can also be challenged and invalidated through the in the court system, but also if it's not been granted yet through the administrative procedures. So the basic thing about the patent is that if you got your patent, well, then you have the right to decide who uses the patent and how during the period of protection and in the place where it is protected. With that right, you can decide what you want to do. You can transfer it, you can license it, you can sell it, or you can give it away for free. It's really up to you as the rightful owner of that innovation. After the expiry of the, uh, of the patent, then your exclusive rights to as an owner of the technology falls away and it enters into the public domain. Everybody can use it as they want. Now, this is not just a matter of protecting the rights of the innovator. It's also a matter of creating a global knowledge of technology and innovation. Now, the word patent in itself has its origins in the meaning of laying open. And this is very much a central part of the system. So the rights are granted by the state to the inventor. It's exclusive right. But what you have to do in return is that you have to disclose your invention. You may have to make it publicly available. It may sound like a contradiction, but that is basically how it works. You get exclusive rights, but you also have to then put it out in the public. And how that is working is that when you do the application, then you have to do a very detailed filing, which includes a detailed description of the invention with abstracts, with drawings, with everything in there, and also a description of the claims, which basically defines the legal boundaries of what you claim to be uh, covered by your invention. The criteria for getting a patent is that it has to have practical use. It has to be new. So when you make a search against what is already out there, you have to come up with basically nothing or something that's different from it. It has to be something that's really inventive. So it's not just being an obvious thing that anybody could come up with or think about. And there are some things that you cannot. You cannot uh, patent, for example, theories, methods, natural materials, treatment methods, and so on. Of course, the, the, the medical uh, products themselves you can patent, but not the methods in which they are applied. And there are other things like that. And again, this is a matter of national laws. So what is patentable and how this is determined is also determined by the national laws. Now, there are different authorities and the places where you can apply for patents. And uh, in each country, uh, more or less, there is a national patent office that receives these applications and then also grants the, the, uh, the patents according to the national laws. There are also some regional patent offices. And one of the biggest ones is the European Patent Office, which is capable also of, 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 of uh, issuing patents. And then we have the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which is administered by the house where we are here in Geneva, in WIPO, but which does not provide patents, but which is a filing system. So, and it's an international filing system. So the idea is that you make one application in this international system, and then it will cover several different states, which are part of the PCT system. So, um, as part of this, there will be done an international search report by an international searching authority. And then later on, it will be given over to the national patent officers to do it. The advantage of the system is that it's normally cheaper, it's faster, and it's simpler to do. And therefore, it is used by major research institutions, the big companies, universities, and so on uh, around the world. Uh, most of those use the PCT system as a primary thing. But it's not the only place where it can be done. So. Uh, to round out the patents here, so the, the, the essential understanding of a patent is that basically are these four lines here, that once you have your patent granted in a specific country, no third party can apply for the same invention. And that's in the, in the whole world. 
Now, in the country where the patent is granted, you decide who can use the invention and how. And that's both commercially and non-commercially. It's basically up to you. In other countries where you don't have a patent, a third party is allowed to copy, use, and sell the invention, but they cannot patent it. They cannot claim ownership, but they're allowed to use it. And you cannot do anything about that unless you apply and is given a patent in that specific country also. Now, if you don't have a patent, you might say, fine, I don't care. Everybody can use it. and That's okay. But you do take the risk that a third party could try to take a patent on the invasion and get the ownership rights to it and use and sell it. And use and sell it, they can do it anyway if they don't have a patent right. And you can't do anything about it. So in other words, or very simply said, the patent protects against third party patenting and against copy in the country of patents. And that's about it. So you can see it's not a foolproofing, it's not fantastic, it's not a 100% uh, 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 protection, but it's the best that is there. And you don't really have any other uh, secure channels for securing it uh, than, than the IP system and especially the patent for this kind of things that you are doing. There are a little alternative, which I'll come back to a little bit later. So once you have your patent, how do you get it out there? And this is where the licensing comes in. So you can, of course, just say, I'm not using my patent. I got it, it's fine, it's mine, but everybody can use it, it's fine, it's your choice. You can also say, I want to control what people are doing. So you can then choose to use a license. And this can be many things, uh, just, uh, many, uh, just as many licenses and their contracts basically, because they all are you know, uh, based on the specific uh, requirements in the situation. Now. Uh, basically, it just means that it's a partnership between you and, every, and, and the ones who you authorize to use it in exchange for payment or fee or royalty or in exchange for nothing if you want. You can, that, you can choose to do it non-exclusive. So that means that you can license it to several different companies. And I'll have a case on that in a few minutes. That can be a, a good idea if you wanted to get uh, far out on the market. But often it also means that the price will be lower, can also be a good idea, but that depends again what you want to do with it. And the idea is that there are several companies uh, who will be out in the market and they will compete and therefore the prices will be lower and it will be faster out there. You can also use a, an exclusive licensing and an exclusive licensing then means that you give it to just one party, one company, for example. Now, if you do that, then uh, in principle, it could lead to higher prices because there will be a certain monopoly. And therefore, it could mean that there will be less uptake of your innovation. But it could also mean that in the longer run, there will be more innovation. And why is that? Well, the basic thinking is that if there is a monopoly, if the prices are high, there is more incentive for others to try to come up with an alternative or improve that invention so that they can get a patent on another one. So it encourages competition in a way, and thereby in the longer run, it might help to make more innovation come out there and thereby also in the longer run, uh, lower the prices and get it further out. So which one is the most advantageous is complex and of course depends on your specific situation and your invention and what you want to do with it. But these are some of the basic thinkings in relation to, to, to these different things. There's also very often, uh, it's not just a matter of licensing one technology, but it can also be what we call a package technology license, where you also, uh, as part of the license, you also get access to the technology, but also the know-how, know, know -how, how to use it, the software, and also there can be a, a demands for a commitment for training and research and development and so on. Again, really depending on, on, on what you want to do with your invention. There's a very special form of, of licensing called compulsory licensing that can come into place in, in countries, uh, for example, in situations of national emergency or if a product has a price that is a hindrance for its uptake and so on. It's not something that's used very often. It's complex, um, but it's there. So in principle, when you are an inventor, when you need to start to engaged in the IPR, well, our recommendation would be that we should do it as soon as possible. We're already in the research and development phase. You can establish a research and development agreement, and that might be a very good idea in order to specify the ownership of the potential outcome. 
And you may actually already have that in your employment contract with your research organization because there is probably specified who owns the, the, uh, the output of your, of your research. But it may not always be as simple. And in, in, in universities globally, it's increasingly being uh, included in the contracts that actually the, uh, the inventor, the researcher who comes with invention has a part right to the invention when it comes out. Whether it's put up for non-commercial use or for commercial use, it can still be a factor. So especially before deployment, the a patent should have been applied for if you want to, to, to protect it. And, and this is not least because reverse engineering is not illegal. So if your invention is a mechanical gadget that basically people can take apart and find out how it works, if there's no patent, there's nothing that hinders them from, from, uh, from basically uh, finding out how it works and, and, and copying it. This is what reverse engineering is about. Now there's something called a patentability test. So if you have a new invention, it might be a very good idea to get the help of a consultant or a law firm, a specialist who can help you decide what parts of this patent, this, this invention should be patented and where and so on. So it's a matter of building a business strategy or making sure that it gets out there as far as, as, far as possible. And uh, and again, uh, once you get the uh, once you get the 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 the, the right, then you can use it for whatever you want to do, commercially or non-commercial. So we have tried to look into a little bit. So what uh, what kind of patents uh, have come out of CGRI? And it's not a very pretty story from our point of view. If you look into Ilri, which is one of those that has done uh, some. We could find 12 in our, in our patent data scope that Anya talked about before. In that database, we have more than 72 million patents and we could find 12 for Millery. So again, maybe not so surprising. It's public research. They're not, you're not really into this game. It's fine, it's okay. But as I tried to explain, there might be good reasons to think about it anyway. And if you look at these technologies here, you will actually see that many of them are the same, but in different countries. So in reality, there are only maybe three or four in here. Here's an example of one of them. It's the East Coast fever vaccine. And you can see what it looks like. So it, the patent application then consists of uh, 85 claims, 79 pages of descriptions and 20 drawings. And this again is this idea that once you get your patent, what you have to give in return is to make it public available and in such a detail that everybody understands what this is about. But they don't have the right to use this in the country of patent unless they ask you about the permission to do so. We looked also at Erie. Erie is a little bit more active in this field and we could find 25 patents in there. But again, as you can, if you look at the list, uh, many of them are the same, but in different places. So in reality, maybe there are seven, eight or something like that. And of course, if we go to the private sector, then um, we try to look at Monsanto, which is now part of Bayer, and we could find 43,000 patents in there, almost 44,000. And of course, this is not so uh, surprising because that is what they live from and they take patterns of every part of the process. And you, you can read the first one there is actually how to make a paste, a, a, a glycophosate uh, uh, paste. And of course, glycophosate is one of their uh, major products. So the next 300 slides are a list of patterns from, from Monsanto. No, I'm just joking, it's not. Here's a case of how, um, a researcher from the Philippines, Dr. Ramon Baba, some of you may be familiar with him, but uh, some years back, he discovered that potassium nitrate uh, is an effective means to introduce uh, induced flowering in mangoes. And this uh, has an enormous uh, productivity uh, benefit. So when he come, came up with this idea, he didn't think about patenting and he didn't think about it until uh, he certainly somebody told him that somebody else was trying to uh, get a patent on his invention. And of course, he was not so happy about that. So he contested, contested the application and it was revoked and he got awarded the patent instead because he could prove through his research notes that he had actually been inventing this uh, before this other person uh, tried to get the patent. So um, in this case here, the patents, that Dr. Baba got ex secured his rights and therefore he could determine who had the right to use his patent or not. And it therefore uh, 
prevented that a third party could go in and 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 uh, and prevent others from using it unless they, for example, paid for the use of it. Uh, this meant that that uh, Dr. Barber here he could uh, get his invention out to a much broader audience. He didn't enforce his patents. He didn't ask anybody to to pay for it. But he had secured his rights, so he could be sure that at least for these 20 years that he was the one who decided who would be able to benefit from his uh, and how from his invention. There's a case here from a small and medium scale enterprise in Argentina that called Synthesis. And what they did is that they invented an oculant for soybeans. It was patented in Argentina and it, went, it was fine. Then they wanted to expand internationally. And what they did was that, that they contracted, they made licenses with distributors in, in various foreign markets. And when they did that, then they applied for patents in these markets also. So that helped them to get on out, to get their technology out on foreign markets. And it was quite successful for them. They experienced a strong growth and they were later bought up by a, a, a large Indian company. Here we go back to the public sector. So the French National Institute for Agricultural Research, INRA, they invented a method called Ugura to produce high yielding rape seeds. And in order to get out it to a broader market, they granted non-exclusive licenses to seed companies. So that means that they gave the light to use it to more than one, more than one seed company in France. Now this was a big advantage because that means that the different seed companies could then develop specific uh, rapeseed varieties that was adapted to various climate conditions in France and therefore it brought it out to a larger market. And at the same time, then uh, in the license agreement, there was a, a royalty payment of 5% from these seed companies up to 2011 and 1% up to 2016. And that was enough to, to, uh, to generate up to 50 million euros for INRA up to 2011. It didn't cover all their costs, but it was a nice little contribution to recover some of their uh, their research costs that they had that even though they were a public research institution. Now, here's another case. It's nothing to do with agriculture, but it's in the medical field. So Ms. Tu Yu Yu here from China, she discovered the artesianin, artesianin in and uh, actually it was even earlier than the 80s. She didn't apply for a patent because in the 70s there was not a, um, a patent office in China, uh, but a non-Chinese company at a certain time applied for the, for the patent. And that meant that, that uh, even though uh, China got a deal with this company who had the patent, they still benefited relatively little from this invention that was actually done by a Chinese researcher. So this is a, a case that shows that, that it's not if you don't uh, protect your things, you, you risk to, to, to benefit uh, a little from it and the other takes it over. Luckily, Ms. Tiyuyu, she won the Nobel, Nobel Prize, so she got her recognition for her thing, but the, her and her country didn't necessarily uh, gain much from it in economic terms. Now, I said before that there was maybe an alternative to having to asking for a patent, and that is to keep your invention as a secret. Um, you probably know the case of uh, Google's Google search algorithm is a trade secret. The uh, ingredients in uh, Coca-Cola is a trade seat and seat secret and so on. So in some cases it, it can be done if you are able to keep it as a secret because that is basically the only protection that you have. Once your secret is out, there's nothing to hinder other third parties to start using it, copying it, or selling it, or even patenting it if you want. Well, that might be a little bit difficult, but in principle. But the idea is that you, of course, you're not restricted, you're not bound by the 20 years uh, patent uh, 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 thing. You don't have to share it with the public, but it's up to you to keep it secret. And the, one of the common ways of keeping it secret is through uh, an, um, is for confidentiality agreements, uh, which is part of the contract with a employee who necessarily have to have access to these secrets. Uh, and that is basically uh, one of the most common tools that are to, to, uh, to, um, to protect your rights. But I, as you can imagine, it's not, a very, it's not a very effective protection and it's very, very vulnerable 
and you risk all the time that somebody uh, leaks your secret and then uh, you might be in trouble. Now, um, for the work done in CTR institutions, um, there's something called the plant breeders right. And that is actually something that is recognized by the International Convention for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants. It states from 1968 was updated several times. And it's related to the VTO and to TRIPS agreements, and meaning that if your country is a member of the VTO, well, then they also subscribe to, to these protection of the plant breeders' rights. It is administrated by something called UPO, which is here in the house also but it's not part of WIPO as such, and it's called the International Union for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants. And basically what they do is that they, they, uh, they give rights to plant breeders based on these criteria that you see there below. And um, there are some rules also, for example, organisms that exist in nature already and natural processes cannot be patented. Uh, you, you gain the right to control the production and also reproduction of seeds, but you can still uh, reproduce the seeds for non-commercial use, experimental use, breeding, and so on. And it also allows for member countries to let farmers use the harvest for propagation within reasonable re limits. Whatever that reasonable limits means, that you'll have to 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 see in the in the in the national laws. So it's not it's not something that you know completely is is there as a as also to help small-scale farmers to be able to use this uh, this right. Um, but still it's also something that protects the rights of the persons who actually uh, was able to breed this new variety. Trademarks, very short, we all know them, they're all over the place. Basically, this is something that has been registered also. It is being, it's also territorial. It's normally for 10 years, but you can renew it all the time. And then there is something called the collective marks also which uh, basically is a mark that protects the college if you uh, a certain standard. And there are many examples of this, for example, fair trade and so on, which is the one that is shown there. There's also, uh, you probably heard about this uh, cyber squatting and that people are registering a domain name for a known company name. Well, that's actually illegal. And uh, here in WIPO, there is now a unit that actually uh, deals with mediation of cases of, uh, of, of cyber squatting. And then there's copyright, which I'm sure that all of you are aware of and probably have copyrighted material uh, in your portfolio already. So basically, whenever you write something, you automatically gain the copyright. It lasts for your lifetime, plus 50 years, and you don't have to do anything to obtain it. But in some countries, there is a possibility actually for make a deposit of your of your copyrighted material just so that it's registered and so nobody can come and say that you know we actually did it instead and, and not you. But um, but this is uh, something of less uh, relevance in in relation here, and it's not something you have to do anything about in order to 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 gain. Now, lastly, um, once the patent information is out there in the open. That also is a, a, a treasure trove of information, because if most inno innovations are patented or enter into the system and they are openly available, well, clever people can use this to make some uh, research in, for example, where is the technology developing fast, uh, what is happening, which fields are developing fast, which are going down, where is it happening, all these kind of things. There's no end to basically what you can get out of it. So you can do a lot of statistical correlation analysis. You can maybe even also start to think about causalities in between in, in relation to that. Now, here in the house, we every year we produce something called the Global Innovation Index, which uh, basically compares countries to one another to see how they're doing in terms of innovation. And it is, as the word says, an index. So it is composed of a large number of indicators. There are around 80 different indicators that is put together to give an idea of whether a country is actually uh, performing very well in terms of innovation or not. This report is freely available and every year it, it goes into a specific uh, subject um, but that it goes in depth into to, to, uh, to investigate. And some of the results you can get from here, for example, you can see, you can make maps where you can see 
where are the major science and technology clusters in the world. And you will see that, you know, it's maybe not such a big surprise because it's very much related to uh, the wealth of the nations. Here you can see where the major innovation centers are. So China, Europe, USA, and, um, and the Middle East is coming up quite strongly also, and India also. And then you can, uh, you can make a nice little correlation here between the wealth of a nation expressed in the gross domestic product, which we have on the x-axis here. So it's a logarithmic scale. And then you got on the y-scale, you got the uh, global innovation index score. So basically what it shows is that it groups the different countries caught as plots them against these two variables. And thereby we can see a, a very close uh, correlation between the wealth of a nation and its ability to innovate. Uh, the size of the bubble uh, shows the size of the population in the area in, in these country, which of course may also be a, um, a factor. You can see the, the dark blue uh, bubbles up to the uh, top, uh, top right. That is the, uh, the rich countries uh, basically uh, with USA and Switzerland in the very top. Um, and so on. And we got China as a big blue one, which is doing very well in terms of innovation compared to the, uh, to the general wealth of the, of the nation as expressed as a, as a GDP with the you know, very well-known limitations that there is in the way of measuring this. But again, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's something that, that shows a certain correlation and certain can help to explain what factors, when you go deeper, are, are there that supports innovation in a, in a country. So some of the things we can look into is also seeing how green technology patterns, how they're developing. And here you'll see that in the green energy technologies, the, the patent filings have actually been going uh, uh, almost, yeah, they have been going down in the last years. And um, if you analyze this a little further, some of the explanations are probably like to that the, there's a certain maturity of some of the technologies like solar panels, but also that government subsidies have been going down uh, for some of these areas and there are a number of other explanations also. But it can help to show what's happening innovation in various areas. So uh, to ram this up, uh, there are a few uh, takeaway points that we would like to, to go back to. And one of them, of course, is that we believe and we hope that this in this short presentation have been able to demonstrate that also that the IP system and the protection that it provides is relevant also for public and non-commercial technology diffusion. It's not only a matter of supporting uh, com commercial exploitation of a new technology. And also that the IP rights uh, is, a, 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 is instrumental for successfully uh, implementing technology transfer, which is not an easy thing at all. That the IP management is part of a national system of innovation. It's one of the gears that make the machine works and, uh, but it's a very important one, we believe, of course. Um, once the information is there, you get a patent, but you have to put information out there. This information can be used for a lot of things to develop new technologies, to build on new in, in, in in innovation and it can also tell us a lot about what it takes to create innovation and where it's taking place and in what areas. And then uh, we hope that you will be using WIPO Green, us here, as a tool to identify and compare technologies and also contact technology owners, all the needs and get your, get your, get your innovation further out there. So with that, we'll thank you very much. And uh, you can contact us at any time on uh, this uh, email address here, or you can look, look us up on the internet and have a look at our database um, and see what else we can do for them. So with that, I will um, take give the word to Ariana. Thank you, Dr. Oxen, and thank you all for an incredibly thorough and relevant presentation presentation. I especially appreciated the case studies that were relevant to the CGIAR context. And I also appreciate that you didn't go through the 300 of the Monsanto case studies as well. Um, 
That being said, a few questions have rolled in and I encourage anybody who's joining us live to contribute further questions as we continue through the question and answer session of this webinar. Um, the first question that came in was about the licensing checklist, which was, I think, something that came up at the beginning during Anya's portion of the presentation, as well as during yours, Dr. Oxen. Um, and the question is really about just in your experience at WIPO Green, what the biggest challenges for licensing and innovations that have originated from the public sector have been so far? Oh, <laughs> that's a, a, a difficult question, uh, but a very good one. Um, in terms of the, I, I don't know what the most difficult uh, or the, the biggest challenges have been, but I think um, one of the challenges are certainly the, um, the um, power distribution that uh, there might be on the one hand who someone who knows very well about IP or has a whole, like if you're dealing with a bigger company, uh, there they have uh, a lot of staff working on both strategy on patenting on licensing and that who are really experts and skilled in the art and if then you are working for a smaller entity um, you might not have that expertise or the the tools available so to overcome um, such a such a well difference in power or expertise uh, we have developed this uh, licensing checklist in order to help um the the parties who are not so skilled uh, with that to to prepare for such um for such a conversation but there are also the other tools available in wipo that help sort of be be more up to speed on those questions uh, another one is also with regard to the use of templates um which um i think i would like to highlight here is that very often in those um, in those uh, discussions, uh, people go in there using certain templates, but forgetting like what should be really clear to anyone who enters into licensing agreements is what the objectives are, and how um, uh, how you want to achieve that before you come into using certain languages. So I think that's very important uh, thing to to prepare when when uh, looking at licensing negotiation. And uh, one thing that's also often overlooked is the, um, the nature of the relationship, because normally there are no problems when the parties uh, get along well and everything goes well, then uh, it's not an issue. But, but as soon as then something goes wrong uh, and the, this aspect of how, how well uh, the relationship is managed comes into play and then problems might arise from that, that is not necessarily a question of um, the, the contract as such, but more in terms of how, how do you manage um, relationships. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Make, yeah, just that in many, many research institutions, they, they, uh, they tend to establish a IP office of some sort, especially universities, and especially in USA, uh, because they are, they are much more into this than in many other countries. And that is generally a good idea because uh, I think as Anya explained very well, it, this is a, a legal legal field. So uh, you need uh, some kind of, of, of legal assistance in this. And this is what many organizations do. They set up a special unit who actually is able to go through that. But if you want to see, get an idea of what are the major points, have a look at this license checklist because it's actually very good because it asks all the different questions that potentially could become a problem further down the line. And there are many things to talk to think about, as you know, uh, that's how it is when you get into to the to the legal areas. Um, but as Anya said, I mean, you know, if you're clear on what you want to do with it and how you want to get there, that helps tremendously. Thank you, that's really helpful. And I think I just have one follow-up question that I know also came up both in your answer and in the, the presentation and different, different points. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the different considerations that come up between research universities and public organizations like CGIAR. Um, that's something that's coming up in the chat right now. Okay, so what, what do you mean more specifically, relations between research universities and public institutions in terms of what? I think maybe like a lot of the different sections you had 
pointed out ways in which the research universities might have, for example, you just said that the research universities would likely have some sort of IP office. And you had also spoken when you were talking about the research and development agreement, how there were different parts of the contract that would pertain to research universities and the, the researchers out there. And I think that the person who's, who's chatting in was just hoping to see some of a comparison to how that would look like in a public organization like CGIAR. Okay, well, I'm, I don't think we have specific knowledge of any specific CTR organization to do that. But again, at universities, you know, some of them are public, some of them are private. But even public, so I'm, I'm from Denmark, so there in all our universities are public. But we also have a, a, a certain incentive from the government to, uh, to take a university and, and, and take it out into, uh, into the commercial sphere also, because they also want the universities to be able to generate income from, from that. And I, so I think the for public university and from CGIR uh, institutions, I don't really see so much of a different. Private universities may be a little bit uh, different because you know they obviously has a, a, a very commercial in well, not only but in some cases will have a very commercial interest in it. But again, you know, if you're a public institution, whether university or whether you're a CGI public research institution, uh, you 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 still the IP systems can still help you to determine how your invention is used by third party. And that can be both for a valuable, both for commercial as well as for non-commercial terms. If, if you look into the recent uh, global sustainability report that came out last month, if you look into that one, there's actually a call for uh, licensing or patents or IP right agreements that is kind of like open source and software. Uh, that is free to use and free to free to uh, to be uh, modified under certain conditions. And and, and basically, such a, a type of open license, uh, open source licensing, can be done as long as you have secured your rights. But if you haven't secured your rights, I mean, anybody can go in and do anything with it and make a lot of money on 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 your invention that maybe you didn't want them to do. So so that is again, you know, where it comes in and and. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid we don't we don't work for CTR institutions. So uh, if Brian had been online here, I'm sure that he could uh, he could uh, answer that question uh, much more thoroughly than than we can. But I think uh, something that um, is also important to mention is that the IPR policy should be guided by the objectives. So it should be a means to support. Uh, the objectives that the institution wants to 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 reach. For instance, if we say uh, they want to bring like do research in order to bring out new products that help feed uh, the world, uh, then they have to think about what is the best strategy to get to that goal. And what I mean here is that both at the end of uh, patenting, but also at the, the end of um, dissemination and transfer, you have to think about what are the strategies that support best those goals. So uh, is it better to, to uh, get uh, information out there um, and uh, make um, earlier stage research results uh, available in a broad sense? It might be best to, um, um publish it rather than patent it or you might want to to patent it but uh, take the decision to make it broadly available these are uh, um, two strategies uh, then on the other hand if you want to have a certain product develop on the market but as a public research institution you don't have the capacity to to go through the process of bringing an invention to commercialize an invention you might be best off working with a with a private sector partner who has the capacity to do uh, um, to do that that work and has the expertise to do that work and you might be better off uh, working in a certain stage of of development uh, working with uh, with uh, such a partner exclusively in order to have the product readily available in the end but as as we uh, keep reiterating if you have secured your assets in that and you have clarified what you want, what your end goal is and what you want to reach it, you can also build that into the relationship with a private sector partner so that it's clear that once the product is developed under what condition it will be made available to the broader public. So that's basically, um, there's basically no difference in how 
uh, public or private sector um, um, entities use IP, it's a tool. You have to be clear about the objectives. Then you have to see how you can best use the tools that are available in order to achieve those objectives. Thank you, Anya. I think that's a great insight and a nugget of wisdom for our viewers to take away with them that the IPR strategy should certainly be informed by these key objectives from, from the organization at hand. Um, another question that came in is a little bit of a, a tricky one, I think, but I'm going to go ahead and share it with you. But essentially, the question, I think, is coming out of a, a reflection of, of the thorough um, process that we went through on this webinar about obtaining a patent and the patenting process. Um, and so the question is, does WIPO Green specifically support the technology transfer only of protected technologies? And if not, what are some things that a licensor should keep in mind for licensing of technologies that are not currently protected, which is something that the, the viewer is pointing out does happen a lot in the public sector. <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> it's not that tricky, actually. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so um, the white green is open to both protected and non-protected technologies. So um, you can make technologies available via Viper Green or sort of promote uh, technologies uh, via Viper Green, whether they're protected or not. One thing that we would advise against if you want to protect them, if you're planning to protect them, you shouldn't put them on, uh, on Viper Green, but you should protect them first and then <laughs> promote them afterwards. But otherwise, also, if you've taken the decision not to protect uh, your uh, technologies you can also promote them through through WIPO Green. And uh, if I may, maybe I can add that um, in the WIPO Green database, um, I mean the technology provider can determine um, the extent of the disclosure of their technology. Um, for example, if a, tech, a green technology developed by one partner of CGIR is in the R&D uh, phase and it has not been going through the patent procedure, but he, he or she want to share that in the that, uh, database, it's okay. Just you can mention that a very, very uh, general broad um, elements of their technology, not the know-how, not the, 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 the thing that will, will be go to the claims of the patent, but can give, mention a very broad one. But if there is a seeker who is interested in that field and see that uh, very general information from that provider, he or, she can also be contacted. So yeah, I mean, the technology provider can determine the extent. That's really helpful context, thank you. And I think also something that would be helpful at this point is just, just a recap for the different links that were provided throughout the presentation, as well as things that you all were referencing so far. So I know we've, we've talked a lot about this licensing checklist. I know also that there was the, the global report, the global innovation index report, that that was something that viewers should be keeping in mind, keeping, keeping an eye out for. Um, and then we now are talking about the database. Are there any other key resources, either from this presentation or otherwise, that, that have come up that you think would be important to share with our viewers today? Well, in addition to what, what you've mentioned, uh, um, the beta database where you can register and upload technologies and needs, but then there are also the other tools that WIPO makes available, such as the online courses um, that uh, cover different aspects of uh, IP, be it um, patents, be it trademarks, or be it IP management, uh, and also uh, specific um, publications and training that is available to SMEs. There's also the, the um, SME division uh, who provides uh, specific support for public sector um, IP institutions and to help them with the setting up policies. Uh, in order to well to make sure that the IP policies support the, the broader goals. Then obviously, as we said, patent scope is available to search patent information. The TISTs are there in order to help um, use that patent in the information in a, in a way uh, that's uh, conducive. There's the um, uh, specific access to the scientific um, literature that is available and the inventor assistance program. 
Anything else? No, I think that's more than <laughs> <laughs> Incredibly comprehensive. Where uh, everything that you, that you ever wanted to know or yeah. not know. <laughs> Start with the Viper Green homepage, and then you'll see uh, you'll see a lot of interesting stuff there. And register there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Well, I shared with our, our webinar viewers the link to register for an account, which was at the beginning of your presentation, as well as other links that came up throughout the presentation. Um, I also shared the email address and the, the website, just the basic website homepage that you shared on your last slide. Um, Great. I think maybe you should also uh, underline again that we are part of the UN system. So the services that we offer in Viper Green are all for free. There's no registration fees, there's nothing. If uh, some of the organizations want to be partners with us, that's also for free, but then we would normally make some kind of partnership agreement and we could maybe uh, in-kind contribution to joint activities and stuff like that would be great. But otherwise we're part of that. And, and, and we are very much as part of the SDG uh, support from the WIPO organization. So this is very much the focus of our work here to support the sustainable development goals and, and to, to, to immobilize technologies in the fight against some of the global challenges of climate change and food security and the environment. Absolutely, thank you so much for underlining that. Um, I don't see any new questions coming in, but I know that people do have access to your email address um, if, they, if they have more things that come up after it in their reflections. Um, I'd love to turn it over to your team just for any, any final considerations or any, any final words before we, we close today. Well, just many thanks for providing us with the opportunity to uh, speak to your audiences and uh, well, we hope uh, that a lot of um, interaction will result from from this webinar. Yeah. <laughs> I hope okay. it has been useful. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, I'm sure it has. Signing off today. Okay.